Listen. Okay, so you guys know the story about uh, how dogs were, air quotes, invented. Uh, about 30,000 years ago when humans were still living outside, they were hunter-gatherers, they, they knew fire, um, they had fire, and they would cook their food and gather on the fire for warmth. And the fire would attract all types of animals, and the smell of the cooking meat would attract animals too. And one of those animals were wolves, gray wolves. Well, wolves are apex predators. There's really nothing in nature that eats a wolf. Wolves, um, as sort of a defense mechanism, have very high levels of a stress hormone. It keeps them out of trouble. Well, just like we have natural variations, like all of you are humans, you're 206 bones, but you're all different heights. Um, some of you are great at lacrosse, some of you are great at not lacrosse, let's just put it that way. But you're all humans, and there's natural variations present in every species. There's natural variations in wolves. And one of those variations are differing levels of the stress hormone. You can have a wolf that has a really high stress hormone and is always very anxious. Or you have wolves that are very low stress hormones and are more low key. So the wolves that have very high stress hormones would stay away from the humans. But the low stress hormone wolves would get a little closer, get a little closer. And the humans were a little intrigued by this. They kind of piqued their curiosity. So they would throw their scraps at the dog or at the wolves. And the wolves would think, I get a meal just by kind of being friendly. So this continued over hundreds and hundreds of years, and we started to domesticate wolves, where they learned uh, that if I stick with the humans, they will feed me, and I better not attack them, or I won't get fed. You know, this, this is a mutualistic relationship. And so you flash forward 30,000 years later, you get Chloe's dog with a smashed in face. Is it so cute? How old is your pug? She's two. She's a black pug. She's a black pug. Yeah. Do you know pugs are amongst the dumbest dogs? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I didn't know that, but it makes sense. Is your dog kind of kind of derpy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Her tongue sticks out all the time. Like, it's just not I'll like show it. you why. Okay. <laughs> so what I would like to do is if I don't get to all of your dogs, I'm sorry, because we do only have a 49 minute class but I want to just show you some skulls of some different um, dogs. And I want to start with a wolf. So Rex, what I need you to do is if you can sit in that chair today and just handle the lights for me, let's start off with a wolf skull. Now you can learn a lot about an animal just by looking at the skull. If you found this skull in the earth, what type of diet would you say this animal has? It's a carnivore, it's a meat eater, right. So let's take a look at some of the bigger breeds we have up on the board. We have a German Shepherd, so let's look at that. And I want you guys to kind of take a mental snapshot. I used to always think as a kid, whenever I blink, it's like my brain is taking a picture. So if that works for you, whatever. But I want you to just kind of get a mental image and remember that wolf skull. And let's look at how these skulls vary over the breeds. Oh, that's pretty similar, isn't it? Okay. Golden Retriever, pretty similar. Big canines. Let's look at a Labrador. Again, we're not too far off. Let's look at a Golden Doodle. I don't know if they, those, these are very new breeds. You know, I'm not that much older than you guys. I went to high school in the early 2000s and Golden Doodles didn't exist. They weren't around. This is a new breed. So it's so new that we don't even have available skulls of it yet. So that's interesting. All right, let's see what else we have here. Uh, Pitbull. If it shows me the skull of a rapper from Miami, I'm leaving. All right. Okay, look at that. We're starting. The snout is getting a little bit more condensed, but it still has signs of the wolf lineage. What else do we have here? All right. Let's do English. Springer Spaniel. Oh boy. Now it's not that far off. I know they're kind of smaller dogs, but still sort of there. Okay, that's 
going to have a very funky skull. <laughs> well, so we got uh, Norwich Terrier Schnauzer. All right, this is not too far, not too far off, not too far off. Uh, King Charlotte Spaniel, never heard of that one. It's King Charles. Oh, I thought he said Charlotte. Ooh, <laughs> oh boy. What the heck is that thing? What does this look like in real life? Oh. All right. Uh, English. Oh boy. You want to talk about an underbite? Look at the underbite on that thing. Hey. Now, let's get to the pug. Oh boy. Yes. Wow. <laughs> you want to know some fun fact about a pug? Sometimes their eyes are bigger than what their skull, their ocular, ocular cavity can hold and their eye can fall out of their head. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll show you one more. That's not on the list. She, hua, hua. Can't type today. Oh, isn't that just cute? Well, these are all different breeds of dogs, but no matter if you're a Chihuahua or a German Shepherd, you eventually evolve from a wolf. And so that is what I would like to get to today is we're going to just, today should be a pretty low brain power day. You guys have been really hanging in there. Um, I do want to remind you that we are 71 days until the AP exam. It will be seven weeks from tomorrow. Uh, to give you an idea of how close it's coming, when you guys get back from spring break, it will be the last week of March, and we will be down into the 40s as the number of days until your AP bio exam. So something I've been encouraging my students to do, and while I have people watching online, is I already had students my first period do this, is if you want to go to Barnes & Noble, go for it, but if you are more of a I want to deliver to my doorstep kind of person, It's twenty four dollars for, two, yeah, a couple grand. Now, when you get one, currently it's on sale from twenty five to eighteen dollars on Amazon. Make sure that it says two thousand twenty one. Last year was supposed to be the first year of the new version of the AP Bio exam, but because of COVID, they had to revise the exam. But this manual says twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one right there. Make sure you get that. It has practice exams in the back. That's what you want to make sure it has. Now, Barron's will work fine. Princeton will work fine. Just make sure it has practice exams, okay? So here's what we're going to do today. Rex, if you can turn on one of the lights. Are we going to go over the exams that you will We're going to go over the mock exams that you'll be doing in April. That's fine. All right, here we go. So today's going to be artificial selection. So Chloe, I, I'm sorry to, I don't mean, I'm sure you love your dog very much. I don't mean to make you talk trash about your dog, but I do want to ask you, if your dog was a product of nature, do you think it would survive in the wild? No. Okay. Why is that? Your dog's an idiot. Yeah. Okay. All right. Where did I put my notes? She's cute, though, so that's what counts. That's actually a selective advantage. Cuteness. Here we go. Artificial selection. It's okay. My dog was a former service dog, but he flunked out because he's an idiot. He does know how to sit. Shank and uh, what is it? Lay down. And he's, he was a service dog for a veteran. So if I do this, veterans sometimes do this when they're having a panic attack. He'll go in there and break up your hands and lick your face. Just 
he's trained to do that. Oh, he's so cute. Plays a big idiot. All right. In any population of a species, there is variation within that species. You guys ever heard the TV show, The Big Bang Theory? I want you to think of Sheldon. Sheldon's a really smart guy in the TV show. Isn't he a professor? Like a college professor? I don't know, I don't watch the show, I'm asking. Is he? Let's say he is. Uh, smart guy, how do you think he would do in an NBA tryout? An NBA tryout, National Basketball Association. How do you think he would do? Not so well. Well, then you have LeBron James, arguably the best basketball player that's ever lived. Uh, both of these two people I'm bringing up are homo sapiens. They have 206 bones. They have 600 and about 50 muscles, two lungs, one brain, one heart. They're humans. But those two people are a prime example how there are natural variations inherent in every species. There's different looking wolves. There's different looking horses. There's different looking great white sharks. There's different looking humans. Well, in natural selection, those variations are, are selected either in favor for or against. Now, what is doing the selecting here? In natural selection, don't say nature, I want you to be more specific. Uh, what type of factors are selecting either in favor for a trait or selecting against a trait? Give me a few of them. Some of the selective pressures that are inherent in nature. I need you to be more specific. Competition, competition for food. What else? Competition, competition for space. What's another? Competition. competition for mates. Competition is the biggest one. So I want you all to remember, I'm going to try to say this day after day after day until it is, you're having dreams about it. Competition for food and water. Competition for space and habitat. Competition for mates. Also, you have predator-prey relationships. You have the weather and climate, you have natural disasters, and you even have diseases that can be a, a selective pressure. All of these together are what we call nature. And so these are, this is the uh, natural environment selecting in favor for or against. So the environment and everything that I just said selects in favor for or against the variance. You may have heard the expression, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. That just means with whatever hand you're dealt, you need to do the best with it. You don't ask for it, you just have to do the best with what you have to work with. Now, typically, nature will select in favor of traits that enhance two things. What would, I, what would I put in my two blanks there? Typically, traits that enhance blank and blank are selected in favor of. You're right. Biological fitness, Garrett. You're not wrong, but what two aspects of biological fitness are there? That's, that's what my two blanks are going to be. What's that, Ella? Okay, so reproduction. That's one of them. You want to make offspring that have the ability to reproduce. What would be the other one? No. You need to survive. Survivability. Typically, traits that enhance survival and reproduction are selected in favor of. You know, being the big bio nerd that I am, when I was driving a plant today on Bayshore Boulevard, I saw this pelican dive into the water, go after a fish. I'm thinking, okay, that pelican found a fish. This is nature's interpretation of saying, well done. You get to live another few hours. If that pelican dives and dives and dives and dives and can't find a fish, meh, meh, nature's saying, not that great. Now, um, this whole aspect of natural selection, what major process does it 
uh, lead to? Blank is driven by natural selection. Evolution. So this all leads to evolution, which is change over time. Now, is evolution and evolution by natural selection, what type of time scale is this on? Is it tens of years, hundreds of years, millions of years? So this is a super long time. Earlier this week, we learned about the evolution of a whale. That took 47 and a half million years to get to the blue whales and the humpback whales and the gray whales and all the whales we have today. Yeah. That, that's where I'm getting at, Ella. That's what today's lesson is all about. So in artificial selection, nature is not doing the selecting. It's not competition. It's not predator prey. It's not the climate. What is doing the selecting here? Humans. Humans are the major selector. They are the selection factor. Yep, we breed dogs to get the traits that we find desirable. When I say we, I mean the breeder. Now, when you wanna find a Labradoodle or a pug, you're not gonna say, does anybody know where I can find a good artificial selector for pugs? No one says that, that would be weird. We say breeder, it's the same thing. People breed dogs, they breed horses, they breed wheat, they breed corn, they breed apples. It's all artificial selection. You're trying to get the most ideal traits possible. Humans select which individuals breed and which ones don't. Individuals with desired traits are bred. Bred is a past tense of breed. Now, you may have heard of a purebred. Uh, your German Shepherd might be a purebred. Your pug might be a purebred. When I was in school, not too long ago, you just gave your dog kibble and that's it. But uh, this is part of your assignment today. What is one of the downfalls of artificial selection when you're specifically trying to have purebreds? Ella? Yeah, there's very little genetic uh, diversity, which we call a shallow gene pool. And so, it would be like if your family had a recessive trait and if you were to reproduce with your sibling, no, it sounds gross, but if you were to reproduce with your sibling, you're a carrier, he or she is a carrier, you have a 25% chance of having offspring with that recessive trait. And so that's why this is what we see with dogs. You know, like my dog has to have a $100 bag of dog food. I'm not kidding. It's like hydrolyzed protein because his body can't break down the big amino acid chains into individual amino acids. He can't break that down. On Thanksgiving, we slipped him just a little piece of turkey. He was pooping water for a week. His body could not convert the complex polypeptides, which are proteins, into individual amino acids. So the food that we have, it's already broken down in form. So he can process it very simply. Like, why can't I just give my dog Purina? He's on a special diet because there's so much inbreeding. And as Ella said, it's very little diversity. And if you have a disease inherited when you have very little diversity, that's what happens. This is why mutts tend to live longer because they're a more diverse dog. A mutt is just a mixed, a mixed breed. Now, now don't, we don't only uh, breed dogs. What other things do we breed? Well, let's do animals first. You say cows? Yep. Horses. Yeah, that's it. Pretty much livestock. Sheep. Yeah, sure. Rabbits. I don't know who eats a rabbit, but whatever. You used to eat a rabbit? Ella used to eat a rabbit. Okay. It's on the video now. I'm sorry. It's official. Uh, chickens. Turkeys. Meow. Cats. Uh, what about plants? What type of plants have we artificially selected and bred? Fruits, fruits and veggies. I would say more than 75% of the fruits and veggies that are in grocery stores are artificially selected. 
The two that really stick out in my mind are uh, wheat and corn. We typically select crops that are more robust, um, that um, they do well in different climates. And they have a high yield. Why should I stop with tomatoes that only have two medium-sized tomatoes growing, or tomato plants that only grow two medium-sized tomatoes if I can try to uh, breed tomatoes that can have, or tomato plants out of eight? So let's say you're a farmer of tomatoes and all of your tomato plants have two tomatoes, but you find a plant that has three. Oh boy. So you breed the three tomato plant with the two tomato plant, it makes a three tomato plant. Oh boy. Then you have two, three tomato plants breed and maybe they make a fourth tomato. And then you just keep doing this until you finally get it to be like maybe five or six or seven. This is artificial selection. What type of time scale is this? Thousands of years. Much, much, much shorter. It's on a scale of thousands of years. Okay, so if you are watching this video, there is an assignment on Canvas that you were to uh, submit by midnight tonight. And that is it for the lecture. For the rest of you.